Hi, everyone. Uh, today, what we're going to do is begin the final section of our class, uh, the final section being contemporary American thoughts. And to do so, we'll begin by looking at Irving Goffman. So in this section of the class, we'll be looking at contemporary theorists who basically are, you know, writing from the mid-1970s up till today. And in doing so, we'll be looking at a continuation of ideas we talked about during the middle years section, the middle, middle years American social thought. So, you know, themes we'll see again, you know, focusing on the micro level, thus focusing on groups, uh, focusing on individuals. And then also we're gonna see um, incorporation of European social thought as well. So, you know, continuing that American tradition, but also kind of adding on to that middle years thread by incorporating uh, Weber, by incorporating Durkheim, incorporating Marx. So we'll kind of see an interesting mix of ideas in these uh, next few theories in our final book of the semester. So what we start to see here is the emphasis on linking the uh, macro level uh, forces and the micro level forces. And when you kind of link, bring the two together, what you're doing is connecting the structure and connecting the agency. So Goffman is probably the most famous American social theorist. Uh, he's written uh, many books, uh, books I often use uh, in my classes. And his social thought can be labeled as uh, structural social psychology. So a lot of people will call him a symbolic interactionist, uh, but he referred to himself as a structural social psychologist. And basically looking at how people think, uh, how people act, and how these thoughts and actions are negotiating so, uh, social forces, are negotiating uh, structural forces. And so basically, you know, it's kind of a theme that we'll be talking about today in the piece that you read. Now, overall, we can recognize kind of a continuation of the psychological tension that we talked about with Mead, uh, with the Adlers, and for Goffman, he gets more specific, uh, rather than kind of a general psychological tension that motivated people uh, to act in certain ways, not act in other ways. Uh, for Mead, here for Goffman, we see he gets specific and says the psychological tension trying to be managed specifically is uh, negative emotions. And so he looks at kind of people trying to avoid embarrassment, avoid feeling ashamed and trying to achieve emotional stability uh, for themselves, for other people in the same uh, situation. So you start to see that unfold uh, in one way or another throughout uh, all of his different frameworks. Uh, because the piece that you read for today was a speech that he gave um, at a conference, you really don't see this specifically, but we, it will be something that we touch on uh, now and again. So overall, the interaction order, as Gardner says in the book, is kind of a, a Durkheim-like understanding, but at the level of the interaction. So here, you know, Gardner in her introduction says that it's his most kind of structural focused, uh, macro focused uh, kind of approach that he's kind of put out there uh, compared to a lot of the articles, a lot of his books. But I don't know if I agree with that or not. It's kind of, this is what you want to emphasize. And so today I'll be emphasizing more of that kind of micro level, more of the uh, identity, the actions and the thoughts that promote the structure. Because I think that's what Gotham's really doing here. Um, rather than, you know, to saying kind of the structure uh, kind of forces the individual, uh, basically it's the individuals uh, through their interactions are kind of upholding the structures. So that's what, I kind of disagree with Gardner's interpretation of it a little bit. So I'll be kind of focusing on that aspect. Uh, yes, the structural forces of norms, uh, situational practices are important, but those norms and practices uh, won't uh, exist, uh, won't be part of the situation unless people are uh, kind of recognizing the norms and doing the actual practices. Again, kind of holding up the structures rather than the structures kind of shaping the individuals. So that's why I say it is a uh, Durkheimian like, because he does kind of focus on uh, cultures and situations. But I think he kind of flipped Durkheim upside down 
you know, we remember kind of the normality of crime piece, normality of deviance, you know, how the culture kind of shapes uh, what is normal, what is not from the top down. Here, again, people are kind of using and upholding culture. So that's what I mean by kind of flipping Durkheim on its head, focusing on a micro level, how people are kind of lifting up culture rather than how culture is kind of shaping people from the top down. So here, when we see this, uh, you know, people kind of working together through their interactions uh, to build and create social life. We also see agency being highlighted. So again, unlike Durkheim basically says we're all kind of socialized in a certain way and uh, to act in certain ways. It's almost he paints a picture of people as being very robotic because he doesn't highlight kind of any kind of free will or any agency too much. And so for Goffman, he says, yeah, we may act in ways that uh, upholds and sustains a culture, but we have different ways of doing it, uh, different ways to practice culture, uh, different motives for actually doing it. So it's not only that we have agency in terms of doing things differently within the situation, um, but also we have different motives to uh, do things in these different situations. And we'll get into those a little bit further. So overall, you know, Goffman, no matter kind of what article or what book he was looking at, he really focused on face-to-face uh, -face encounters. Uh, there are a couple exceptions to this, uh, but for the most part, you know, his analysis center was looking at when people are face-to-face uh, -face in social situations, whether it be two people interacting with each other or larger groups of individuals uh, interacting in kind of those face-to-face -face encounters. That's what he's kind of getting at. You know, in these interactions, you know, how is order created? You know, how is uh, order maintained? So it's kind of an interesting kind of uh, focus of analysis. And that's why I often like to use his readings and his books in my classes, because typically uh, students do find uh, his analysis of social life to be interesting. So anyways, getting back to why Goffman specifically you know, likes this encounter, the face-to-face -face encounter, because he says is when you know, people come together that the essence of the social aspect of life uh, emerges. So in other words, you know, when we're kind of isolated from each other, uh, there's really nothing kind of social going on in terms of uh, interactions. But when people get together in an interaction, then the essence of the social dimension of life uh, really emerges. And it emerges because people have to think about the situation is different. So, you know, if you're alone in the situation, you're kind of thinking in one way. But as soon as you add, you know, another person, whether it be somebody you know or a complete stranger uh, to that situation, uh, then you have to kind of think differently. You can have your own individual thoughts, but you have to have kind of a joint perception of kind of what the situation is, uh, how the situation should uh, unfold. And also it's not only about kind of thinking about the situation difference when other people are present, but also you have to act differently. You have to act in kind of in joint manners. And so, you know, that's what basically Goffman's saying, the essence of social life really emerges when people start to interact uh, with one another. And then we can study these interactions to recognize how order is kind of created from the bottom up, how order is created in these social interactions. So he says, you know, when, you know, that other person uh, does kind of get involved in the situation. So the face-to-face -face encounter uh, comes to the forefront. We have these identifications of selves. So again, you know, it's not only kind of who am I in relation to these people, but who are they in relation to me? Uh, who are we kind of in relation uh, to each other? So again, again, that social element, you have to think about yourself, not as yourself, but in yourself in relation to others. Uh, others in a relation to you, you know, people uh, in a relation to each other as a whole. And, you know, Goffman says, you know, in these uh, interactions, you know, at first, at least, you know, that people are very uh, cautious in their interactions because you have to kind of ask yourself, you know, is this a safe place? And is this safe to uh, interact here? Is there any risk involved in this interaction? Um, you know, are we going to butt heads at all? Uh, are we going to be on the same page, kind of a harmonious interaction? So again, it's kind of the social psychology of the situation at hand. And that's why Goffman kind of referred to himself as a, a structural a social psychologist. 
and he says, he kind of going back to trying to avoid uh, those uh, negative emotions, both in oneself and in other people. We tried to find both verbal and nonverbal ways to reassure people that the situation is uh, safe, that we're going to be on the same page, whether it be just kind of, you know, a glance, a smile, or kind of a, you know, asking a question, how are you doing, anything I can help you with. So again, these things may be sincere or not, uh, but, you know, Goffman says it doesn't matter that the sincerity, we're motivated to kind of put people at ease because when people are awkward and timid, uh, typically that makes other people in the situation awkward and timid as well. So we want to avoid those kind of awkwardness and the strange emotions, and thus we try to kind of uh, create a calming, smooth situation. And we have, again, various ways of doing that. So here we can get into the kind of macro part of it, kind of the top-down part where, you know, Goffman does get into, you know, the importance, uh, the significance of situational norms and practices uh, within situations. So basically, you know, the norms are the rules of the game attached to a situation. And then we can say the practices are kind of playing by those rules. So when you have the rules and people play by the rules, you know, order is created. Again, kind of going back to that kind of Durkheimian approach to creating social order. So people do rely on these norms uh, to kind of tell them how to play the game. Uh, they do use the norms uh, to promote kind of interaction order. So that when you, when you practice the norms, you know, everybody's kind of doing what they have to do in the given situation to create order. In other words, if you're not playing by the rules, that's when uh, the dysfunction can emerge and that's when the disorder uh, can emerge. And so we'll get into this a little bit more in our second book of the semester. But nevertheless, you know, we rely on culture to inform us kind of what to do and then we can use that culture uh, that we're kind of told what to do to create order uh, as a whole. So here again, it's that top-down kind of structure or focus, but then Goffman again goes back to the micro level. And he says, you know, we have different motives of doing this. So, you know, why are we you know, following the norms? You know, why do we practice what we're supposed to practice? And he says the motives vary. And uh, going back to what I've talked about, you want to avoid you know, you know, psychological tension, you know, you don't want to feel awkward, uh, embarrassed, you know, other people to feel awkward, embarrassed as well. Uh, you want to put people at ease, you know, make people feel comfortable in the situation. Uh, you want to maintain uh, social functionality. So, you know, Goffman talked about kind of a business situation, you know, you want everything to run smoothly, to be functional, otherwise it's going to be a bad for business. Uh, Goffman talked about a criminal, how the criminal wants to kind of follow the norms and kind of put people at ease through different practices, and that's not to uh, come across to anybody as suspicious. So again, kind of how people can not only use uh, the norms and their practices to keep the situation uh, functional, but also how people can use the norms and different practices for their own kind of personal advantages kind of getting into the criminal, not wanting to come across as being suspicious. Uh, he or she will kind of act as they're supposed to act and they're kind of come across as they're supposed to come across so they don't set off uh, any alarms. So not only do we have different motivations for kind of upholding and practicing the norms and the expectations of the situation, uh, we have different techniques for doing it. So we can put our own little spin, our own little fashion uh, on kind of what we do. So we can say they're kind of practiced uh, within practices, meaning that, yeah, you know, we have a kind of a role to play, but uh, we can play that role differently and still kind of accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, you know, maintaining the situation as being uh, functional and maintaining the situation as being smooth. So overall, you know, going back to kind of what I said, yes, you can focus on that top down how the norms and the expectations of how you're supposed to act in a situation is part of that situation. You know, we don't get to um, kind of define the situational norms and the expectations. They're defined for us. But on the other hand, when we focus on the individuals kind of playing the cards that they're dealt and playing the cards differently, this is how the individuals kind of are uh, upholding and sustaining life you know, from the bottom up. So again, the rules may be there, but if we don't follow the rules, then disorder 
uh, dysfunction is going to emerge. And when we do follow the rules, you know, we have different motives for doing it and we have different ways of following the rules too. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a broad kind of framework that Goffman kind of used in all his different studies and all his different theories. And we'll kind of see that uh, be evident again in that final book of the semester, how we look at social order, to kind of focus on it, not only from the top down, how order is uh, created and negotiated uh, from the bottom up. So we'll leave that there for today. And then for our next uh, theory, we're gonna get into you know, a couple different American theorists and how they incorporate the classical ideas. So here we see the incorporation of Durkheim, but then we're gonna turn our attention to an incorporation of Marx, uh, incorporation of Weber within the next couple American theorists.